I get confused. There's a Kurt Kaiser and Carl Kobe's. Both have K names, but uh, they're beautiful singer. So this is our time for offering. And uh, we celebrate the fact that you're able to come out and give this day. With joy, we present offerings of commitment and support for the work of Christ Church. Ephesians 1 verses 15 to 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of all Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened you may know what is the hope to which he has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. For above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our gospel lessons from Matthew 25. Familiar words. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a sheep, a shepherd, that separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry? And gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink and when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing and when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you and the king will answer them truly I tell you just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family you did it to me then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, 
or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away in the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of the Lord. Well, for a while, I used to help with a breakfast at uh, Kenmore, a prayer breakfast for men. A friend of mine uh, knew a Muslim friend he used to work with, and he was gracious enough to come and share about his Muslim faith. Rashid is a, a gentleman, full of grace and anxious to do right by his understanding of God. When we came to talk about an afterlife, he seemed to understand the good deeds he did as a way to increase his standing before God. And even though he affirmed that we depend on God's mercy, he hoped that his good deeds might be counted as merit in the life to come. Well, in our book study, we were actually given an example from the Rwandan conflict, the genocide, years ago. It compared a Christian leader and a Muslim in relation to the parable of the sheep and the goats. The Christian man betrayed Tutsi's families who had written to him for help. And he was contrasted in that action with a captain from the Sengalese army, a Muslim, who had risked his life repeatedly to go out and rescue Tutsis in his jeep, saving five at a time as he was able. And his actions eventually led to his death. The story was presented to ask the question in practical terms, which life would you wish for yourself as you stood before God in judgment? Each of us are challenged to imagine how we treat the least of these in our midst. Gary Schmalzenberger wrote, while teaching in Germany, I saw a young man in a motorized wheelchair watching soccer practice. I thought to myself, how he must long to jump over that chair and kick the ball with those players. Then it all stopped, as one theologian player went over and brought him out onto the field and ran up and down, pushing that wheelchair, batting it against the ball. The young man hung on for his life, and all of us who watched and, and had done nothing stood there with our mouths open. That's it just as you did it for the least of these. And come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom. We've all heard these stories. We've grown up in the United Church of Canada. The, uh, I think if I can find it, I'm gonna go back to where, I, where my story should be. There we are. The uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant tradition is uh, rife with looking out for the little guy. The parable is certainly a United Church of Canada favorite, but it's no means confined to our denomination. It's one of those key passages that underlie what modern theologians used to call the social gospel, foundational to much of the work of the ancient monastic orders and some of the newer orders. In fact, the parable of the sheep and the goats is probably one of the most quoted parables of all time. All the nations are gathered before the judge, before the throne of the Son of Man, before the king, and the king separates the right from the left, the sheep from the goats, and he judges them. And those on the right are saved, and those on the left are condemned. The judgment is made on the basis of compassion, the love or lack of it shown by those who are gathered before the throne. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. The Son of Man tells those on the right and he says the opposite to those on the left. I was naked, you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Well, we sometimes think that religion is about believing stuff. And if we believe the right stuff, we're safe. But it seems not to be so. 
Rather, our faith is more about awareness, about having our eyes opened to the real world and responding compassionately to it. Whether or not we are aware that Christ is there. And the parable is calling to us to see the Son of Man in that squalling child who's getting in our way, or to hear the voice of God and one who begs before us for food. The parable alerts us to the importance of compassion and the fact that the Son of Man is present in the needy of our world to encounter the least of our brothers and sisters of the Son of Man. We don't really need to go across the globe to Yemen or Ethiopia or an overcrowded prison in our own country. There are many who are marginalized, might uh, be people who escape our notice here in Conrad, perhaps even occasionally attending a church or even within our own families. Remember the first and the greatest commandment. The one about how we are to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Consider what the Apostle John, the disciple of Christ, says about that love in his first letter. He writes in chapter 3, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity for him, how can the love of God be in him? And again in the fourth chapter, Anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he's given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. The sheep. Those on the right have shown their love for their brothers and sisters and in doing so show their love to God. And so they enter the kingdom prepared for them. Their faith is alive, even if they haven't grasped the fullness of it. Even if they haven't recognized how the Son of Man is everywhere about them. You could say that the law has been written on their hearts. It's guided their actions, not their thoughts and words. If our eyes were open to the depths of the real world and not the shallow world of conventional wisdom, then we would see God present in everyone and everything, especially in the needy, in the least important ones. And that would be even more transforming, not only for the sheep, but for the goats as well. For those who might have the right creed and the right doctrine, who may have judged the least among us as being not deserving of their love and care as being not people of whom the Holy One dwells. We proclaim today that Jesus is the head of all. As Jesus experienced life, just like us. Alistair McGrath was speaking about the necessity of Christ being a lot like us, but also different. For if Christ is just like us, he can't be the solution to our fallen human condition. He must be the head of all, because he leads us to a better place, a better way. Perhaps the biggest problem faced by Christians in ministry is just knowing where to begin. Poverty seems so widespread. Suffering is universal. Ignorance is pervasive. Sometimes we get overwhelmed by statistics. We're accustomed to thinking big thoughts and having big dreams and grandiose projects, and we're sometimes frightened by the magnitude of our own proposals. But Christian ministry demands that we think small. Think in terms of helping one person, launching one project, righting one wrong. In the judgment scene in Matthew 25, Jesus portrays one standard of judgment love as reflected in ministry. As a Palestinian shepherd would separate the sheep from the goats at night, the Lord is pictured as separating the righteous from the unrighteous, and the division is made based on their ministering love. It's not based on their great projects, it's based on what they've done for individuals. 
by following our leader, we know where to start. We start right where we are. The place to begin ministry is right at home. Those persons who are judged righteous in Jesus' story are persons who help people in need, those around them. Our own community has people who are hungry and lonely, sick, improperly clothed, imprisoned. They are our starting point for ministry. We serve where we are. As churches or individual Christians, we minister to the possibilities that surround us. Every community will have different needs. Every church has different possibilities, but the, there are needs and possibilities for all. But this story teaches us how to start. You start with the simple. You notice that the acts uh, praised by the Savior are not big and spectacular uh, actions. They're simple acts of human love and ministry. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to feed or clothe or to visit someone with a particular need. It's all about our willingness. Uh, Crabtree told the story of a disastrous rock festival. It was convened down in Louisiana back in the 1970s. It never got off the ground. And there were thousands of young people marooned in a small rural area, choking on dust and scorched by the sun. They were ridiculed by those around them. And as it was breaking up, the local pastor mentioned to his congregation that thousands of young people had been gathered in an area close to their church, and yet the church had done nothing to help them. That afternoon, several of the church community drove out to the area they took cold water and sandwiches and they provided a bus and a way out for those who wished to have a way out. And then they carried them to a little town called Pineville, where they were given food and a place to bathe and clean up and travel connections. It was a simple act of ministry. The parable suggests that we also have sympathy. In Jesus' story, the persons singled out by the divine judge for blessedness are all surprised at the recognition. As far as they were concerned, their acts were just the normal responses of Christian love. Love is the basis for all of our ministry. And love provides a kind of sympathetic uh, response to a person who needs it. Ministry without uh, self-consciousness. This was evident because they started with Jesus. Jesus had identified himself with those in need, bringing people to an understanding of Christ and an acceptance of him as a savior is a goal of ministry. Therefore, God has also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. All things in heaven and earth, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Those words are a triumphal part of the proclamation of what God has done for Christ as a result of his humiliation. It involved his incarnation and shameful death on the cross. But the apostles declared that because of this faithfulness, of God's only and unique begotten Son, he's been highly exalted to a position of sovereignty over all created things in heaven and on earth. And he declares that every tongue should proclaim Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What does that mean? Is it merely a complimentary title that's been bestowed upon him? What are the implications of his being exalted to a position of lordship. That title, Lord, is not really well known in our contemporary life. We're more familiar with terms that have a, a similar meaning. A king or an emperor, a dictator, a president, a commander-in-chief. But Jesus came. He lived, labored, died, conquered death, and lives forever to lead us to God. 
He lives and so was able to lead us into this world as servants of God. So we recognize this day his authority over our time and his right to command our talents. He has an absolute right to claim our resources. The risen Christ embraces the whole person. Christ loves the image we project of ourselves. But Christ loves all of our shadow sides as well. There is no part of our life that is hidden from Christ. And in that knowledge, the head of the church offers us a warm embrace. God wants us to, God wants to lead us to a better place. But he does accept us where we are. So this morning, make Jesus the Lord of your life. And the more completely you yield yourself into submission to his loving will, the more you will discover the liberty of a life in freedom within the Spirit. We thank God for that. Amen. We're going to sing when I needed a neighbor. Or we're not going to. We're going to listen. It's up on the screen. Explain the singing. <laughs> responses break us Lord and make us Lord I was thinking you just saying them myself but I put the whole prayer up on the screen so if you want to join in on the break us and make us you're welcome to let us pray together when we have afflicted others by our own power or by our silent support of systems which oppress enslave and crush break us Lord when we have perplexed others and purposely confused them for our own gain or driven them to despair, break us, Lord. When we have persecuted others, casting them out of our community, leaving them forsaken and alone, break us, Lord. When we have struck down others, casting stones on their dreams and hopes until they are destroyed, break us, Lord. Then broken, we carry in our bodies the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. Amen. Make us, Lord. With the power which belongs only to you, make us into your treasure. Make us, Lord. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Make us, Lord. Do not be exceedingly angry, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Make us, Lord. The final hymn is the old rugged cross. <laughs>
these are unsettling times, and uh, sometimes you need words of comfort. My wife uh, dreamt about the Lord's Prayer, or sorry, the Lord is my shepherd, the 23rd Psalm, last night. Thought to use it in a benediction for our churches. I thought I could switch up and use that this morning as well. Here are these comfortable words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> 